Good morning and a very, very blessed Christmas to all of you. Great to be together at Ferndale on this kind of a feels like Christmas morning with the rain and a bit of, bit of cold. All we need now is some snow and we'll be, we'll be good to go. Irene joins me in wishing you a, a truly blessed Christmas. Her knee up is more painful than she expected and uh, so uh, she's resting and walking and resting and walking and carrying on. But uh, sends love to you and uh, thank God for his, his mercy to us. Now, I want to ask, stop asking a question and I want you to be really honest. I want you to put up your hand if you are not a morning person. If you're not a morning person, hold it up, just put it up, okay? If you're not a morning person, okay? Well, first of all, thank you. First of all, well done for getting here, you know? Because <laughs> you'd probably uh, rather be in bed. Um, but but if, for those of you who are not morning people, um, I, I need to let you in on something that you may not have been fully aware of. There, there is a thing called sunrise. You, you may never have seen it, but there, I promise you there, there is such a thing called sunrise. Um, I am a morning person, and thankfully Irene is a morning person as well. That really helps. Um, I'm, a, I'm a morning person, normally sort of wake up but anywhere between four and half past five, and uh, I, 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 I see the sunrise pretty well every morning. If I'm running, which I don't do every day, but if I'm running around Blair Gowry, the area we, where we live, uh, one of the things I love is seeing the sun rise and come over the, the skyline of Santon. Uh, it's really lovely. And, and even if I'm just sitting in my study and I see, watch the sunrise, it's, uh, it's wonderful. One of my favorite places to watch the sunrise is in the bush. Our daughter-in-law is involved with these fancy game lodges, so we've, we've got to go to some of them sometimes. And uh, you get, get a wake-up call at five o'clock in the morning and you sort of head out to the coffee station and grab a coffee and a rusk and jump into the Land Rover and you start riding through the bush and in the next hour, as the sun comes up, you just see the, the colors and the contours of the bush. It's an absolutely fabulous. We take our holiday normally in May uh, down at the coast in Mshlonga. May is the best time of the year down there. Uh, the weather's good, it's not too sweaty, there are not many, not many school kids around. Um, and uh, so we, uh, friends let us use their place right on the promenade in Schlanger and we get up again, we get up early, make the coffee, sit on the veranda and you'll see the, the sun starting to peep over the horizon and then this ball of red comes up and it just forms this golden pathway across the, uh, across the sea toward the shore. It's absolutely, absolutely fabulous. So I, I love sunrises. I love sunsets too. Of course, you morning people know all about, you not morning people know all about sunsets. But uh, sunrise. And in the uh, the prophecy of Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist, you remember, we've been studying that in, in, in our study of Luke's gospel. In Zechariah's prophecy recorded in the gospel of Luke, the, the coming of Jesus into the world is spoken of as a sunrise. In fact, in Luke chapter 1, verse 78, Jesus Christ is called the rising sun. Now, when Zechariah was holding his little baby boy, John, John the Baptist, when he was holding that little boy in his arms, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gave that wonderful song, that wonderful prophecy that we looked at a few weeks ago in Luke. 
But uh, look at these words. This is part of what he said, not all of what he said. As he held baby John the Baptist in his arms, he said this, You, my child, you, John, will go on before the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus, to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, here it is, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. Now, two themes stand out in this rather unfamiliar part of the Christmas story. And uh, they provide us with the key to understanding the meaning of Christmas. If you don't understand these two themes, Christmas will make no sense at all. And uh, these are dominant themes throughout Scripture, right from the beginning. And uh, many, as she read, started off from Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then God said into the darkness, let there be light. And there was light. So right as the Bible opens, this theme of, of light and darkness is there. And it's all the way through the, the pages of, of Holy Scripture. So they're familiar themes. And uh, we'll never appreciate the dawn, the, the, the sunrise, We'll never appreciate the light until we've come to realize the depth of the darkness. So I just want to do two things this morning. I want us to think about darkness and therefore our need for the rising sun. And then I want us to think about dawn, the coming of the rising sun. So verse 79, if you look at verse 79, we think about darkness and the need for the rising sun. Verse 79 speaks of those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Now, who are the people being referred to here? Who are the people living in darkness and in the shadow of death? Darkness, and we trace this right from the beginning in Genesis, darkness is the result of sin. And we've all sinned by breaking God's law, by going astray, by choosing our own way instead of God's way. And uh, Zechariah's statement refers to the condition of the whole world. Galatians 3 verse 22 says, but the scripture declares the whole world is a prisoner of sin. In other words, the whole world is in darkness. 1 John 5, 19, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Revelation 12, 9, Satan who leads the whole world astray. So we're talking about a, a darkness that is, that is extensive, that is pervasive, that affects everybody. And when Adam and Eve, the first parents, the first two who were created a little further on in that creation story, God said, let us make man in our image. And then he made Eve out of Adam. And he gave them the command in the Garden of Eden not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they disobeyed. And when they disobeyed, sin, in sin entered into the world and darkness and death through sin. And that's when this darkness pervaded the world. And that's the overarching message of the whole Bible. So the Old Testament prophecies make this clear. So for example, Zechariah, I beg your pardon, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Great prophet Isaiah says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, this is Isaiah prophesying 600 years before the birth of Jesus, 
But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea, along the Jordan. And here it is. How will he honor that area? The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, light has dawned. A couple of verses later, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be called Mighty God, ever Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So right back in Isaiah, there is this darkness and light theme and the promise of the coming of the sunrise. A light is going to dawn. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2, similarly. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. And the New Testament writers, the same thing. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said this, talking of their condition prior to their coming to salvation, he said, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. Further on, he says to these Ephesian believers, he says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. There again, that darkness is this change. You were once dark. That's who you were. You were born in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And then I I love 1 Peter 2, verse 9, where the apostle Peter talks about believers as those who were called out of darkness into God's wonderful light. So the Bible teaches, just summary, The darkness is caused by sin. And therefore, because we're all sinners by nature and we're sinners in practice, darkness is our natural habitat as we are born and live in the world. And darkness is characterized by uh, by delusion. Often people don't realize they're in darkness. I'm not in darkness. I'm smart. I'm good. You know, I've got a PhD. I'm darkness. I'm not in darkness. It's characterized by depravity, various forms, various levels of sinfulness. It's characterized by despondency, a deep down sense that life is not what it should be, that something, something critical is missing. I was reading the other day in a new book that I've just got... Um, courses that a couple of years ago were offered at both Harvard and Yale on how to find happiness. They were oversubscribed. They were elective. It was an elective course. It was so oversubscribed that it pretty well bombed out some of the other electives. And so they decided not to offer again. In In one of the courses, 900 students signed up how to find happiness. There's a deep sense, despite being in the Ivy League universities, amongst the most privileged people in the world, there's something not right. There's something missing. Don't know what it is. That's a symptom of that darkness. Darkness ends in spiritual death and separation from God. The wages of sin is death. And darkness is a condition from which we cannot escape by ourselves. I don't know if you were watching the news a few weeks ago uh, uh, coming out of North India, that situation where they're building a huge tunnel uh, uh, under a section of the Himalaya mountains to put a highway through. And uh, kilometers into this tunnel that they're building under the mountain, it was an earth tremor and part of the roof of this great tunnel, probably is is the size of this building, collapsed and it trapped 41 workers inside the tunnel. All the roof came down, 
onto the machinery. And for 17 days, those 41 miners were trapped behind there, behind the rubble. And the thing is, there's no way they could get out. Their salvation had to come from outside. And uh, the whole world, they sent special machinery, the whole world got busy to try to get them out. It took 17 days. Fortunately, they had a pipe that was sort of going through under the rubble and they managed to get food and water and medicine to them. So they all, but they eventually came out, but impossible for them to get out. Salvation had to come from outside. And that's exactly our situation. If people would be safe, if we would be safe from our darkness, it had to come from outside. And that's the message of Christmas. It did come from outside. So let's think for a moment about the dawn, the coming of the rising sun. Let's go back to that, uh, those words of Zechariah. Look, look, at, look at the text again. He says, you, my child, you, John, will go on before the Lord Jesus to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. And... Uh, so look at verse 78, calls Jesus the rising sun or the dawn. And it says he will come to us. That includes you. He will come to us. To those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. The sun will come to us. Will come from heaven again and again. Comes from outside, not from inside. Not from down below, but from above, from God. And he will send into, and it reminds us that he will come because of the tender mercy or the, the merciful heart of God. And that's the, that's the wonder of Christmas. And we heard it yesterday. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because of the tender mercy of our God. And of course, with the coming of Jesus in the manger in Bethlehem, and of course, his subsequent, can't talk about the coming of Jesus in little uh, isolated boxes. Of course, there's his coming into the world, his living a sinless life, his death on the cross in our place, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension to the right hand of the Father. So when we talk about the coming of Christ, we're talking about each of those individual things and all of them together because they can't be separated. By the coming of Jesus, the rising sun came from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. And the two, the two blessings that come out of this are deliverance, the rising sun or the bright dawn of salvation, the Good News Bible translates it. The bright dawn of salvation will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. And so when the, when, when the sun rises, everything changes. And when Christ comes into a person's life, everything changes. Just as the sunrise changes the landscape, we can be in pitch darkness, groveling around, unable to know where to go. But the sun rises and, that, and everything changes. And, the, and the, what changes is the provision of forgiveness of sins. Give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins. And so there's that wonderful, that rescue. Let me ask you this one. Do you know what it is to have your sins forgiven? A deliverance from the guilt and penalty of sin. And then the second blessing Zechariah mentions is direction and to guide our feet into the path of peace. And just as when the sun rises, you know where to go, you know where to walk. Uh, earlier in this year, on our road trip with Jonathan and Ethan, 
we visited the Kango Caves. Some of you have been to the Kango Caves down in, down in the Cape in the Otsuran area. You go in a, into the mountain, into these massive caves, like these huge underground cathedrals, absolutely marvelous. And at one point, this whole tribe of us tourists were in there and we're marveling at the stalactites and the stalagmites and they're all lit up with these special, all the special lights and it's absolutely incredible. And you say, wow. You know, and he's given you all these statistics as to how many millions of years they're old and you know, one drop at a time has made this thing and, whoo, and all of a sudden you're not even watching and the guide flicks the switch pitch darkness and you're standing there and you can't even see your hand if you hold it up to your face it's, I've never been in such darkness and you don't want to move because you, you know where you're going to go. Yeah, so you just, you just sit and you stay in the darkness. And then he gives a little more blah, 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 as tour guides do, very interesting. And then obviously he knows where the switch is and he just touches it. And everything changes. It's a wonderful picture of what happens when Christ enters the life of an individual. And how do these twin blessings of forgiveness of sin and direction in life uh, guide our feet into the path of peace, peace with God, peace with yourself, peace with other people, sort of a a wholeness, a happiness, a a sense of well-being, That's what he guides us into. That's the way. That's the new way. And how do these blessings become ours? Well, he calls us to himself. Peter, I read that verse earlier. He calls you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So there's 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 the call of God's side where by the Holy Spirit through the gospel he, he calls you to come to the light But there's something in us, John says, that we don't want to come to the light because it exposes us. We don't want to come to the light. But he calls us to come. And then as we come in answer to his call, everything changes. And Jesus, and uh, you, you read this verse, I think, I wonder in your reading earlier, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so to enjoy this promise of forgiveness and of walking led, having your feet guided into the paths of peace and wholeness and happiness, you must follow him. You have a decision to make. Am I going to follow him? And sometimes a, a service like a Christmas Day service can be, a, can be a crossroads, an absolute crossroads. You can kind of hit a fork in the road on a day like today. Am I going to follow him or am I not going to follow him? Am I going to stay in the darkness thinking I'm in the light? Or am I going to follow him? Follow me, Jesus says. You will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Because he says, I am the light of the world. As I finish, there's a, the final chapter in the Old Testament in the, the, the book of the prophet Malachi. I, I love Malachi. It's just a short, but it's kind of the last, the last word of the Old Testament before those silent years and the coming of Zechariah's prophecy. But Malachi uh, chapter 4 verse 2 has echoes of this very theme that we have here in Luke chapter 1. Listen to this. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2. But for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness, S-U-N, here it is again, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. I love that picture. 
I mean, this is where Zechariah in the New Testament got this image from, Zach, from Malachi in the Old Testament. The rising sun will come to you from heaven to guide your feet into the path of peace. And the old prophet Malachi, you will be, what, what will it be like when that happens? He says, you will be like calves who are leaping as they released from the stall. And so the picture is you lock up the calves in the stable for the night and they're all cramped and they're all shoved in there and they're sleeping uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, and, then, and then in the morning you open the doors and, they just, and you say, okay. Off they go into the, into the pasture. And if, you know, I won't try to demonstrate because I may break something, but you, you, know, you know how they kick, up, they, they, they kick up their legs and they just go springing around and he says, you know, you, you'll be like that. There's a, there's a joy, there's an exuberance, there's a passion, there's a freedom when you are living in the light. When you are in Christ and in the light. And it's that, it's that picture from Malachi that uh, Charles Wesley, the great Methodist hymn writer, had in mind when he wrote that famous Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We didn't sing it today, but uh, listen to, the, you're, you're familiar with this verse of that. Hail the heaven-born, want me to sing it? No, no. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Here it is. Hail the Son, S-U-N. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn king. Let's pray together. How wonderful it is, Lord, to have your word, your truth, the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, on this Christmas day, we rejoice in the gift of Jesus. We rejoice that the rising sun has come to us from heaven. To change the lives of those sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death through the forgiveness of sins and to guide our feet into the paths of peace. To give us joy and hope so that we skip like calves released from the stall, from the crampedness of the darkness into the joy and liberty of life and light in Christ. And so, Lord, we thank you. Give you glory. And we celebrate your love. In Jesus' name, amen.